My friends, it is such a pleasure for us to welcome you to the Lady Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church. You are about to experience one of our worship services that we have every Saturday morning, starting at 11 o'clock and ending at 12 noon. Our address is 231 Lake Griffin Road, Lady Lake, Florida, 32159. We're very excited. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 37 and 38, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. We certainly invite you along with the Lady Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church congregation to be that laborer, to answer the prayer that Jesus asked us to pray. We ask that you will be blessed as we now go into our church service. Thank you so much for being here with us. Father's love how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretched treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face. Chosen one, bring many sons to glory. Behold the Lamb upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders, ashamed. Zoe Kleinman with the BBC writes this article about a display that was at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. The item was an intelligent toilet. 
The price tag, a mere $9,800. Despite that price tag, over 40 million earlier versions of the Neo-Rest toilets have been sold. The bathroom firm Toto said the new prototype was still in development. Its self-cleaning process uses a combination of disinfectant and a glaze made out of zirconium and titanium dioxide, which coats the bowl. Once it flushes, it sprays the interior of the bowl with electrolyzed water. The proprietary process, she says, essentially turns the water into a weak bleach. This bleach is the interior, killing anything that is in the bowl. Meanwhile, an ultraviolet light in the lid charges the surface of the bowl. That makes it super hydrophilic or water loving so that nothing can stick to it. It also makes it photocatalytic, enabling oxygen ions to break down bacteria and viruses. Imagine this, all in a toilet. You don't have to clean the toilet bowl except for once a year. Although we are constantly coming up with new and improved versions of virtually everything, even toilets, no one has been able to develop or improve upon our Savior. It's not as though it hasn't been tried, but how do you improve on a Savior who is God? How do you improve on a salvation that promises God's righteousness in exchange for your sinfulness? How can anyone improve on the sacrificial and unconditional love of Christ? Electrolyzed water cannot compare to the waters of His baptism. Ultraviolet light cannot match the brilliance of His glory. Oxygen ions and titanium dioxide cannot cleanse us from the contaminants of sin like the blood of Jesus. He is the only Savior who can take our sins away, not simply once a year, but once and for all time. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once, for all time. Father, we ask that as we look at this summary and overview of the Day of Atonement, that you will impress upon our hearts our continual need and dependence on the shed blood and intercession of Jesus. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to open your Bibles with me to the Old Testament book of Numbers. We're going to Numbers chapter 29, and we will read verse 11. <clears throat> we are in a series studying about how to know Jesus better. Back near the very one of the first few Sabbaths of January, we made a commitment to the Lord, a New Year's resolution, that we would get to know Jesus better this year. And that's what we are doing. Now, if you have been keeping track, this is number 20 in a series on getting to know Jesus better. And, and I still have lots of stuff to share, so who knows what number this is going to be. Today, however, is an overview and a summary of what happens on the Old Testament Day of Atonement. And then in the future, the future next few Sabbaths, we will be looking at how that applies to us today. We are Seventh-day Adventist Christians, and Seventh-day Adventist Christians have a unique teaching that comes specifically out of the Day of Atonement, and that is Christ's ministry on our behalf in the heavenly sanctuary right now at this moment as our high priest on the end of time day of atonement. Now, some people might ask, 
why, pray tell, are you Seventh-day Adventist Christians hung up on the Day of Atonement? Well, in the Old Testament Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the books that were written by Moses, Moses laid out that book, in those five books, in a specific order. If we had time, and we'll do this in the future, we'll break this down. It's called a chiastic structure. So draw a big X. Let's do that right now. Here's a big X. And whatever is on the base, did you, do you see the X? Okay, so here's this triangle that forms the base of the X. You've got that part, right? Okay, so I'm going to whiteboard erase, chalkboard erase the top part of that X. And now we have a pyramid of sorts or a triangle. I'll put the base on there so you have three sides for the technical geometric people that we have in here. You have this triangle and if you were to look at the first part of Genesis and near the end of the book of Deuteronomy you would find things that correlate with each other. Then you go further into Genesis, maybe even into Exodus, and you go uh, backwards in Deuteronomy, closer to the front of Deuteronomy and getting closer to what book is Genesis, Leviticus, Numbers. You get close to the book of Numbers. Those things correlate with each other. And so as you work your way from Genesis and Deuteronomy and you start finding things that parallel, you come to the top or the pinnacle of that triangle or of that chiasm and you find Leviticus 16 at the top or the pinnacle at the most important part of that chiastic structure. So why would people who study the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, be concerned about what the Bible says in the first five books and what its pinnacle is? Because we are Bible-believing Christians. And Bible-believing Christians are impressed with what God did to make something impressive. And when it comes to the Day of Atonement, God put Leviticus 16, which is all about the Day of Atonement, as the pinnacle of that chiasm or of that pyramid in the writings of Moses. Does this make sense? So that's why we are going to have a several-part study within our larger series of getting to know Jesus better. The Father's love ran so deep for us that Jesus will continue to cover you with His blood throughout eternity. The Father's love ran so deep for us that the blood of Jesus will cover you throughout eternity. Here we are in Numbers chapter 29 and verse 11. It says in Numbers 29 verse 11, One kid of the goats for a sin offering, beside the sin offering of atonement, and the continual burnt offering and the meat offering of it, and their drink offerings. When the Bible tells us that there is a continual burnt offering, this is what it means. In the morning, just as the sun came over the horizon, you would have priests on a ram's horn, and they would blow those ram's horns, and the morning burnt offering would be slain. Just as... That trumpet is sounding, that, that sacrifice, that continual burnt offering was slain. And because it was a burnt offering, it was put on the altar of burnt offering, that altar that is in the outer courtyard before you get into the holy place and the most holy place, and it was there burning all day long. And then in the afternoon, there was another burnt offering offering that was sacrificed and put on that altar so that you had every 12 hours a sacrifice that was put on that altar of burnt offering and kept continually burning. There was not a time 
when there was not, when the sanctuary service was in its working status, you understand. Not a day went by when there was not a sacrifice that indicated God's total dedication to you and your total dedication to God. It was a continual burnt offering. Now go with me to Exodus 30 and verse 8. Genesis, Exodus, chapter 30 and verse 8. Exodus chapter 30 and verse 8. The Bible says here, in Exodus chapter 30 and verse, let's start in 7. Exodus chapter 30 verse 7 says, And when Aaron lights the lamps at evening, he shall burn incense upon it. A per- and Aaron shall burn thereon, I read 8, we are in 7. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning. When he dresses the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. Verse 8, and when Aaron lights the lamps at evening, he shall burn incense upon it. A perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generation. So this is what we have. Um, In our past studies, we learned that this incense represents Jesus and His righteousness presenting our prayers before the Father. And Bob has a recording of that on the CDs and DVDs if you would like to get that. DVDs, no CDs. You can pick that up from him next week if you let him know this week. So we have an offering that is always being offered... And we have prayer represented by this incense, the righteousness of Christ, always before the most holy place, which is where the presence of God was found. So you have two things that happen on a daily basis, and they happen continually. There is not a time when the sanctuary was operating that there was not a burnt offering on the altar of sacrifice. There is not a time when the sanctuary was operating where there was not incense going up before the Lord and representing our prayers mingled with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The point here is very simple. Even on the Day of Atonement, the people were in constant dependence upon the blood of the sacrifice and the intercession of the incense. So, in the antitype, that would be the Day of Atonement at the end of time, we will study the detail of this beginning in October 1844. Lots of biblical evidence for that. So, in the antitype, at the conclusion of the cleansing work of the Day of Atonement, cleansing both the heavenly sanctuary and the sanctuary of our hearts, when the sealing work has taken place and we would rather die than commit known sin we will still stand in need of the covering blood of Jesus as long as we have a sinful nature. Now, at what point is it that you and I do not have a sinful nature? At the second coming. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, and we will be hitting on this uh, very much so tomorrow in our memorial service for Miss Nancy. The Bible says that we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for this corruptible must put on what? Incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. My friends, today, tomorrow, and all the way up until the second coming of Jesus, you and I are dependent on the shed blood of Jesus as our righteous life, and the intercession of Jesus as offering righteous prayers before the Father. Without the sacrifice of Jesus and without the intercession of Jesus, we are lost, even on the day of atonement. You are not without a Savior. We're going to look very quickly. It's going to be just simply a summary At Leviticus chapter 16. So let's go to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus chapter 16. So you're turning to the left from where you are. Leviticus chapter 
16. The summary begins like this. In verse 11, so if you want to read through the verses in your mind's eye as we are going through this on the screen, please feel free to do that. In verse 11, a young bull is to be slaughtered as a sin offering for the priest and his household. So the priest slays the bull and he collects the blood in a basin. Now you see that collects the blood in a basin in brackets. That's because the verse doesn't specifically say collect the blood in a basin. However, later on the priest has to carry that blood into the most holy place and do, dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle it. So he has to have something to carry that in with. Does that make sense? So we are assuming that he collected the blood in a basin. Verse 12 and 13. Burning the incense. The priest is to take the censer of burning coals. That should be coals. Take the censer of burning coals from the outer altar and the incense. So outside of the sanctuary, you have the altar of burnt offering that has that sacrifice on it. Every 12 hours, another sacrifice is there, showing our dependence on the sacrifice of Jesus. Some of those coals are taken off of that altar and the incense and those coals are brought into the most holy place. Then the incense is put on those coals so that the incense can begin to smoke and sort of make this this, uh, covering between the Shekinah glory, the visible presence of God, and the priest that is working in the most holy place on the Day of Atonement. Then the priest exits the most holy place and he goes into the courtyard. Verse 14. The priest applies the blood of the bull to the most holy place. So this is what we have. The priest slays the bull, catches the blood in a basin, takes the the censer with coals in it, takes the incense, goes in before the most holy place, puts that on there, and leaves that there so the smoke can begin to bubble or, or to rise. You know, have you ever lit those little incense sticks in your house? Yes. Have you ever had a bonfire? I mean, anything that makes smoke. You know how sometimes smoke goes up fast, sometimes it doesn't go up so fast, sometimes it just hovers and lingers? Just get that mental picture that this sanctuary is filling up with this fragrant smelling smoke. So then the high priest takes the basin of blood from the young bull that was the offering for himself and for his household. He takes that blood into the most holy place and he sprinkles the blood once eastward toward the mercy seat. Then he sprinkles the blood in front of the mercy seat. What, pray tell, is the mercy seat? There's a box in the most holy place called the Ark of the Covenant. On top of the Ark is a cover. That cover was made of gold, had angels on either side of it, and the visible Shekinah glory of God dwelt between those two cherubim. Psalm 99.1 says the Lord dwells between the cherubim. So the high priest would sprinkle the blood once eastward on the mercy seat. He would then sprinkle the blood in front of the mercy seat seven times and he would take that blood out of the most holy place and into the courtyard. Verse 15, the first part. Then he slaughters the Lord's goat. So let's back up just a little bit. There were two goats that were selected to be used in the service on the Day of Atonement. Once those two goats were selected, they cast lots over those goats. One of those goats became what we know as the Lord's goat. And the other goat became known as the scapegoat or Azazel's goat, or you could just simply call him Azazel, or you could call him a goat, you could call him a demon, and we will unpack that in the future. We don't have time for that today. So, in verse 15, the first section of verse 15, in Leviticus 16, the priest takes the goat that has been designated as the Lord's goat, and he offers the Lord goat as a sin offering for the people. Now, the unique thing here is that this goat called the Lord's goat 
did not have any sin confessed on it. It had no laying of the hands on that goat to symbolize, as we studied earlier in our series, that the laying on of hands transferred authority, transferred sin, transferred responsibility to the one that had its hands laid on it. So he slays the Lord's goat and he collects the Lord's goat's blood in a basin. Then he takes the Lord's goat blood into the most holy place. He takes the basin of blood from the Lord's goat, takes it into the most holy place, sprinkles it once eastward toward the mercy, or on the mercy seat, and then he sprinkled the blood with his fingers in front of the mercy seat seven times. And then he leaves with the Lord's goat blood from the most holy place. As he goes out from the most holy place, he takes the blood of the bull and he puts the blood of the bull on the four horns of the altar of incense. Now, the bull was the sin offering for the priest and his family. So he evidently had to go out and get the bull's blood and bring it back into the holy place. You'll notice this. He goes into the most holy place with the blood of the bull. Then he goes into the most holy place with the blood of the Lord's goat. Then he goes into the holy place with the blood of the bull, puts the blood on the horns, and then he goes into, let's just read here, he puts the blood of the bull on the four horns of the incense altar, and he sprinkles the blood of the bull before the veil, that's the veil separating the two apartments in the sanctuary, in front of the incense altar seven times. Then he takes the blood of the Lord's goat and puts that blood on the horns of the altar of incense. And he sprinkles the blood of the Lord's goat before the veil in front of the incense altar seven times. And then he leaves with the blood to the outer altar. Verse 18 and 19, he takes the two blood, the blood of the Lord's goat and the blood of the bull, and he mingles the blood together. And he takes that basin of mingled blood to the, what does he say here? He puts the mixture of the blood on the four horns of the outer altar. And he sprinkles the mixture of the blood on the outer altar with his finger seven times. And then he gets rid of the rest of that blood by pouring it at the base of the outer altar. Now again, this is just a summary, you understand. Y'all don't go to sleep on me. He, he then takes the fat of the animals and he burns them on the altar of burnt offering. Then the carcasses of those animals, that would be the hide, the flesh, and the dung, is taken outside the camp by one of the priest's assistants and burned. So the assistants burn the carcass. After they burn the carcass, they have to be cleaned. So the assistants wash their clothes, they bathe in water, and the ritual is finished, and the priests then continue with a regular daily offering. That's the summary. Look at with me at Leviticus 16 and verse 16. It says, and he, that's the priest, and he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And now let me ask you a question. How did the uncleanness of the children of Israel get into the sanctuary? Well, let's keep reading, right? I mean, you guys are throwing out good answers and right answers. Let's find it here in, in the Bible. We are in verse 16. He shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their, what? Sins. Now, in the original language, there is literary evidence that that should not be translated because of their sins, but it should be translated because of their sin offerings. 
You remember when we studied the sin offering, the person that brought that offering would lay their hands on the head of that sacrificial animal and they would confess their sins onto that animal and that animal would then carry the guilt, the weight, and the penalty of that sin. And then when that animal was slain and that blood was caught, the Bible says in Leviticus 17.11, I believe is the reference, that the life of the animal is in the blood. So that the life of that animal that died on behalf of the sinner, that life or the blood is carried into the sanctuary and left there. What was it that caused that animal to die? It was the sin of the what? of the human being that brought that animal to stand in his or her place. William Shea writes this, biblical scholar, such a translation strongly indicates that the Day of Atonement sin offering ritual, that's what we just talked about, functioned to clean the sanctuary from only the confessed sins of the penitent Israelites. So if the sacrifice had not been brought, if the sins had not been confessed, and the blood taken into the sanctuary, or the priest, if the priest was not involved with the sin, the priest had the option of eating a little bit of that sacrifice, and thereby symbolizing carrying the life of that animal that was slain into the sanctuary when he went in. And if you guys want these notes, I'm happy to give them to you. It says... The Day of Atonement sin offering ritual functioned to cleanse the sanctuary from only the confessed sins of the penitent Israelites. That is, it functioned to remove the sins that had been confessed and transferred to it by means of the sin offerings that had been offered previously during the year. Notice that in our summary the progression on the Day of Atonement was opposite of the progression throughout the rest of the days of the year. Throughout the rest of the days of the year, sin was transferred into the holy place, into the sanctuary. On the Day of Atonement, the direction is reversed. The movement on the Day of Atonement is opposite from the daily sacrifices that were offered. It went on the Day of Atonement from the most holy place to the holy place to the courtyard and then outside the camp of the children of Israel. This is symbolism in telling us that the high priest is making atonement or he is removing those sins that had been transferred off of the children of Israel to the sanctuary on the Day of Atonement. He is taking those sins out of that sanctuary and then they are transferred to another animal that is part of this ritual. The high priest makes atonement for the most holy place, then the holy place, then the altar, and then out to the altar of burnt sacrifice. Because there is no laying on of hands on the Lord's goat before it is slain, it is clear that no sin was transferred to this Lord's goat animal. And thus the blood of the sacrifice is sin-free blood, not sin-laden blood. Since the blood is sin-free, its function when applied to the sanctuary is not to defile it by a record of the sins which it carries, but to cleanse it by its application to the various parts of the sanctuary. So you have this goat that is representing the Lord and it dies. And the blood of that animal that has no sin confessed on it is used to cleanse the sanctuary from the defilement of the children of Israel who defiled it by confessing their sin over an animal and that blood being transferred into the sanctuary. What is the purpose of storing the sins in the sanctuary? You and I will recall many, many moons ago when we studied the sanctuary as as a building that contained the glory of God. 
The Bible says in Exodus 25, 8 and 9, God tells Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may what? Dwell among them. Let them make this according to the pattern that I'm going to show you. And then you get to John chapter 1, verse 14. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. When Jesus hung on the cross, the Shekinah glory was veiled in human flesh in the body of Jesus. And when the temple veil was rent from the top to the bottom, there was no Shekinah glory showing in there because the visible presence of God was hanging on a cross. So, when the sin was transferred from the sinner to the sanctuary, who was it in essence that carried the sin, the weight, and the guilt of that sinner. It was Jesus Christ. So, the purpose of storing the sins in the sanctuary was to show that God carried the sins on Himself. This is the purpose for showing His justice in forgiving sinners. Someone has to pay the penalty for sin. And that someone must be greater than the one who has committed the sin. And that someone must be the one that created the one that sinned. You know, I would imagine that the angels were willing to arm wrestle for the, the high honor of allowing Jesus to stay in heaven and them to come die for humanity. But that wouldn't pay the price. Only the life giver could offer his life as a substitute for the life taker. That would be sin. When Yahweh forgives guilty people, he incurs judicial responsibility. God forgives the sinner, and so someone has to pay for that sin. Does this make sense? That's all that sentence is saying right there. By creating an imbalance between justice and kindness that affects his reputation as ruler. You've met these people. Oh, hands down. This is what it says. It is a black and white issue. There's no gray area here. There is no mercy for them. They just need to be A, B, C, D. Maybe we've been part of the group of individuals that said that before. God incurs judicial responsibility because he creates an imbalance between his justice and his kindness. And that affects his reputation. Let's just play this out in a true-to-life scenario for us. You're talking with someone and they say, you believe in that Christian thing? How can a, how can a God that demands justice save people that are sinful? And why would a God that you claim is merciful burn sinners throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity future? I mean, what if all they did was disobey mama by stealing a cookie from the cookie jar? And they never confessed it. See, God creates an imbalance because of his justice and his kindness. It affects the reputation of God. Restoration of equilibrium. That means bringing things back to what is, and we really don't know what normal is, but bringing things back to normal. Restoration of equilibrium is enacted through ritual purification of the sanctuary. That's what we just talked about. Which represents vindication of Yahweh's administrative justice as he sheds judicial responsibility. Let me unpack all these big words. The sin is brought into the sanctuary. The sinner goes free. And now who carries the sin? In essence, it's Jesus, right? And so then, when the sanctuary is cleansed, Jesus is going to take those sins that he has been carrying and he's going to put them somewhere. Are you following with me? You tracking? All right. You are or you are not? Catching what's being thrown. Okay, so here it is. It says, as a result, the Israelites who show their continuing loyalty to him receive the second benefit 
of moral cleansing and clearing in the sense that the forgiveness already granted them is confirmed when the forgiver is vindicated. When the sin that is transferred to Jesus is then moved from Jesus, that act is what completely clears our sin. And that act takes place on the day of atonement. You and I right now are transferring our sins to the heavenly sanctuary. Hebrews talks about us there being a heavenly sanctuary. When Moses received instruction to build the earthly sanctuary, God says you need to build it just as the pattern of the one I showed you. And so God's character is vindicated when the sin that Jesus carried to the cross When the sin that we today transfer to the heavenly sanctuary is removed, it has to be put somewhere because there is a culpable individual that needs to carry the result of that sin. Now at the beginning of this Day of Atonement, they cast lots. And how many goats did they have when they were casting lots? They had two goats. One goat represented the Lord's goat. And then what is the opposite, if you were going to take an opposite of the Lord's goat, what would you say the other goat is? Satan's goat. We're going to look at this here. We think. In Leviticus 16, 29 and 31, it says that they were to afflict their souls on the Day of Atonement, meaning that they were to humble themselves in repentance. If the children of Israel, on this Day of Atonement in the Old Testament, sanctuary service, if they did not humble themselves in repentance, they would be cut off from the camp. They would be cut off from the protection of the camp. They would be cut off from the protection of God. They would be cut off, meaning that they would come under divine investigative judgment concerning what would happen to their future in the afterlife. Modern Jewish scholars recognize that Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is a time for the completion of a divine investigative judgment of human beings. The Day of Atonement involves a special work of cleansing. I want you to open your Bibles with me to Ezekiel. These are very um, pertinent verses when it comes to the cleansing of the sanctuary. Ezekiel 36, 25. Ezekiel 36, 25 says this. Ezekiel 36, beginning in verse 25. It says, Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. How do they get to be clean? Whoever the I is sprinkles clean water on them. So whose responsibility is it to sprinkle the clean water in this? The I. All right? The I individual here. He continues. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. So there's this I individual that is responsible for the cleansing. Does this make sense? So could they cleanse themselves? No, the I individual has to do that. Verse 26, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart of your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh. Who's responsible for taking out the stony heart and giving the new heart? The I individual. Verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Who is responsible for making sure that you obey the statutes and the judgments of God? The I individual, keep reading verse 28, and you shall dwell in the land that 
I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Who is responsible for the cleansing? Who is responsible for making sure the people are clean? Who is responsible for taking the stony heart away and putting the new heart in there? Who is responsible for taking away the disobedience and making you obedient? Who has the responsibility to do that? God does. Can't we understand that our salvation is not dependent on what we do? It is dependent upon what God does. God cleanses you. God takes away the stony heart. God puts the new heart in there. God takes away the evil spirit. God puts His spirit in you. God takes away the sin. God gives you a new life in Him. This is the responsibility of God. Our responsibility rests in our reaction to what God has done for us. If you are cleaning your room for your parents because you have to, your parents would much rather you leave it dirty. Because the spirit behind that bitterness that is building up in you for having to clean your room is not what your parents appreciate. But when you recognize that your parents provide everything for you, take care of you, give you some spending money on occasion, when you stop to think of this major, big picture of what your parents do for you, you are tempted to be willing to do something for them, aren't you? This is what God is impressing us with. God took the most precious, took a most precious part of the triune Godhead. Jesus willingly accepted a subordinate position to the Father and didn't think it was something to be, to be envied to be in the Father's position. And He did this so that He could cleanse you, so that He could give you a new heart, so that He could put His Spirit in you, so that you could walk on this earth and be obedient rather than disobedient. Not so you could feel like a failure because of your disobedience. If that's the case, then my friends, we need to spend more time with Jesus. We need to ask Jesus, teach me how to let go of my life and allow you to impress upon me. And Jesus, give my hands and my feet and my mind and my heart the willingness to do what you're asking me to do. I think we're too focused on stopping our own issues rather than letting the issue stop or stop it for us and replace it with something better. All of this responsibility lies on Jesus. Malachi chapter 3. How do we get the gospel out of the Old Testament? This is how we get it. We're in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Malachi chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Malachi's, find Matthew and back up one book and you're there. Malachi 2, verses 2 and 3. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who will stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Verse 3. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasing unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Who is responsible for the cleaning? God is responsible for our cleaning. God Himself assumes the ultimate responsibility for the cleansing and the obedience of His people. These two goats stand in opposition to each other. One is the, is the scapegoat and the other is the Lord's goat. Now I want you to watch this. The clean Lord's goat blood went into the sanctuary and symbolically cleansed the sanctuary of sin. God, having taken the responsibility of sin, the guilt of sin, the weight of sin, is going to transfer that to its rightful owner. 
Watch this. The scapegoat, Azazel's goat, the second of the two goats, only comes into play after the casting of lots. It only comes into play after the sanctuary has been cleansed. Does this make sense? It only comes after Christ's work of atonement is complete. It's not part of the work of the atonement for the sanctuary because that was already completed before the scapegoat gets there. Now, I'm going to jump ahead. There is a sacrifice that stands every moment of every day on your behalf. It is not a dead sacrifice that is burned up and consumed on the altar of burnt offering. It is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ who lived his life so that you could be credited with his obedience, so that you could be credited with his sinless, spotless nature, so that you could be credited with his character. Jesus did this for us, and he ever stands ready to share that with you if you are willing to let him. Next Sabbath when we are together, Two Sabbaths from now when we are together, we're going to look at this scapegoat and how that transferring, that removing from Jesus, temporary holding the responsibility of that sin. Jesus is going to place that on the scapegoat, Azazel, Satan. And that plays itself out in the book of Revelation. Is it your desire this morning to thank Jesus for ever standing in your place as your sacrifice. To thank Jesus for ever standing in intercession on your behalf. Not pleading that God the Father, who loved you so much that he gave his own son, will not kill you. But thanking Jesus that he carries you on his heart and he's talking to the Father about you on a daily basis. Would you like to thank Jesus for that this morning? Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the sacrifice, the continual sacrifice, the continual covering of the blood of Jesus on our lives. Father, we need that because we mess up. We blow it. We get mad at our wives or our children or our bosses. Lord, thank you for the cleansing blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for ever living to cleanse us love you so much. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. The Lord said to Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, saying, On this wise you shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. God is blessing you now. May you be blessed this week as you take the gospel of Jesus to the world. Friends, again, thank you so much for joining us here at the Lady Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church. Sometimes people ask us, you know, how can I support this ministry? How can I support putting this ministry onto the internet, onto different Roku channels? And so we'd like to answer your question. To the right of your screen on your computers, if you are on llsda.com and you've clicked on the media link, you'll see a donate tab. We encourage you to return God's tithe to Him and then to give God offerings as He has blessed you. Some people say, you know, I'm not comfortable doing that over the internet. How, how would I send money to, to return my tithe via a check and to give God offerings on a check? Well, you can send that to the Lady Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church, P.O. Box 609, Lady Lake, Florida, 32159. Again, thank you so much for serving the Lord Jesus Christ and being faithful to Him as a harvester 
in his fields that are ripe with harvest. God bless you.